It's February 1st and it's 63 degrees here in New York City. Very confusing weather. But I'm actually okay with this. I, I like this weather. I've grown tired of cold weather in the last few years and I don't really like winter sports very much. So I'm a painter. I can adapt to anything. I'm okay with any kind of weather. A friend of mine sometimes says when confronted with any situation, fine, but what does it have to do with Cezanne? So it's 63 degrees in the middle of winter, so I'm asking you, what does it have to do with Cezanne? When I was a kid, I spent a great deal of time fishing, and I've never been that interested in the sport and actually catching fish. What I love are those long stretches of solitude before a deep blue sea. Just me standing there looking at a big expanse of ocean. There's no image, there's no focal point, there's nothing really to look at. It's just my eyeballs and the color blue. And I wasn't cognizant of this at the time, but now I know many years later as a painter, that what I valued in those moments was because there's nothing specifically to look at when you're viewing the ocean, it becomes looking at looking. You're seeing yourself seeing. And that's one of the primary things I'm invested in as a painter, the, the act of seeing, the process of looking. Not only is a painting about what, you're, what you're, you're looking at, the image in the painting, but a painting is also about the process of seeing. And that's made me think a lot lately about James Turrell the West Coast light and installation artist in his sky spaces, in which he takes a very reductive, very dimly lit architectural environment for five or 10 people. And then on the ceiling is an aperture, either a square or a circle, through which you see the sky, the actual sky and real light. There's no image, there's nothing to look at, but he finds the thingness in something as fugitive and, and ethereal as light and then places it into a language that we can relate to as, as physical beings, uh, both with our bodies and architecturally. It's placed in a frame, which taps into the long history of, of painting, the idea of a proscenium, of a window. And then there's also the commentary of the treatment of light in painting, especially in Western painting, uh, with, with uh, the symbolic treatment of light, with, uh, with Vermeer, Rembrandt, Blakelock, uh, Turner, the American Luminous School, on and on and on, and then the optical effects of light with the French Impressionists, the Divisionist painters, Chuck Close. Light is of, of, of primary importance to a painter. And Hans Hoffmann said that in nature, light creates color, and in painting, color creates light. And that idea of looking at the process of looking makes me think of this Degas painting from 1876 called The Absinthe Drinker. And this is one of the ones I use in my slide talks. And I, I, I show the enormous amount of movement in this painting as not being supplied by the sitter, the woman in the painting, who's in a very static position, gazing off into the middle distance. The movement in this painting is supplied by our eyeballs as we negotiate that zigzag in the foreground through the tables. We bring the movement to the painting. The burden is on us. We're implicated, not as passive viewers, but as active participants in the dynamism of this painting. And it's not anything new, and it, it doesn't have to be new. There's way too much emphasis on novelty in the art world now. New is not better. New is just simply less old. I don't care about new. I care about what can you do with something? What can you show me? What can I do with something? And I use this Degas painting to segue into the word abstraction in my talks. And I define abstraction not as a style. Abstraction is not a thing. I define abstraction only as a process, as a thing to do. I don't consider myself an abstract painter. I don't even know what that means. I, I'm not an abstract person. Um, I, I think I'm very much here, tangible. <laughs> I think of myself as a landscape painter who arrives at my paintings through the process of abstraction. And to abstract simply means to remove, which implies that it must be removed from something or somewhere. For me, it's from the landscape I know very deeply, very personally, very intuitively. From trees, from rivers, from, from plains of ground, from light, 
all those things reduce down to just visual signifiers, which allow the viewer a lot of freedom and permission and latitude to graph their own sensibilities and emotions onto those signifiers, and then hopefully generate content of their own. I've always believed that an eye not told what to see, sees more. And I think when there's a lot of room there for the viewer to impart themselves into the painting, actively, not passively, it becomes about looking at yourself looking. And I think it's far more personal that way. And, and with this gigantic, globalized, streamlined world that surrounds us now, I think sometimes the more personal is a good thing. One good way to look at the process of abstraction is to look at the tree images of P.A. Mondrian. This is called the Red Tree from 1908. And you can see immediately, it, this is a direct observation of nature, uh, a very Dutch painting, the rich soil, the sky, the tree, the expansiveness of the tree. Also, you can see the imprint of the Fauve painters in the high key saturated color, the counterintuitive use of color or the emotional use of color. I like the way that the tree traverses the sides and then off the top of the painting, lending it a certain flatness. And then you have the sky. And notice that the sky is not just a backdrop for the tree itself. The sky is a very aggressive participant in, in the flatness, in the structure of the painting. The sky seems to squish through the tree branches like silly putty, uh, becoming a very aggressive counterpoint to the branches themselves. Um, we ask ourselves again, what does this have to do with Cezanne? The answer is everything. This is the beginning of the laws of nature giving way to the laws of art. If we move into the next image, you can see the tree is still there, the image of the tree, but the most obvious difference is that he drops color. Whenever you downplay color in favor of just value, it tends to focus more on structure, on architecture. And here the architecture is becoming more splintered, more fractured, more overall. Even though there is a coalescing of the image toward the center, it still feels somewhat tree-like. There's also an equanimity to the, the, the way that the, the lines start to spread out from the center. Um, and also notice the brush marks that appear as negative space become even more flattened and more plank-like. Big flat rectangular brush marks uh, which, which represent the grid which will come much later in his career. The next image we see even a more severe reduction of the image in favor of just repeating crescents and arcs which now start to move away from the center, from the core, the crux of the tree into the earth from the first image. Now off to the, they migrate to the edges of the painting which gives it a more overall feeling, a, a, a more a more uh, atmospheric feeling, uh, which, which possibly presages some of the overall effects of Pollock's drip paintings. The focal point starts to dissipate in favor of an overall atmosphere. Now the next image, an even more severe reduction, he, he starts to, to eliminate the, the, the diagonal and the curve altogether in favor of just the vertical and the horizontal. The vertical always representing the human figure, the horizontal always the landscape. And then those two in concert with each other, and whenever they cross, they create little detonations that, that move the eye throughout the painting uh, with, with energy and with, uh, with vitality. And you can see a complete overall, uh, you know, pressing out and expansiveness of the image. Still representative of, the tree, of a tree, you see, you know, overlapping branches, you see things through other things. The black, which is a very non-dimensional color in this case, still has, is kind of a stand-in for, for wood, for branches. And you can also see the oval, which I think relates to the, the lens of the eye. Uh, this is from around 1912 or so. Then if we move to 1921, some of the, the, the more non-representational images that, that most people know Mondrian for, uh, here again reduced to a highly geometric vertical horizontal structure with wider and more uh, even black lines. Again, very non-dimensional, uh, very urban in its architecture, very grid-like, and then reduced down to just basic primary colors and very flat uh, applications. If you look at these closely, if you go to MoMA and see these in person though, they're quite sensuous. There are very delicious creamy brush strokes in these, but in an image like this where you can't see that, you see just the structure. But I hope you can see that it did come from nature, it did come from observation, from something he knew very intimately from trees.